This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with author Anne Marks regarding her new book, Vivian Meyer Developed. Vivian Meyer became an overnight sensation when over 140,000 professional quality photographs by Meyer were found in abandoned storage units throughout Chicago. Documentaries from Netflix and the BBC followed, with the common theme of trying to assemble a portrait of the very private and very quirky nanny who happened to be a photographic savant. Mark's new book digs deep to answer those lingering questions about Vivian's identity, her past, her shortcomings, and her compulsions. And now, a clearer picture of Vivian Meyer with Anne Marks. Anne Marks, thank you for joining me today on the Art Sense podcast. And you have written a new book, Vivian Meyer Developed. Can you kind of tell us where you enter the story of Vivian Meyer and how you decided to, to go down this path of extensive research? I entered the project sort of late. What happened was John Maloof and others had um, discovered Vivian's work in a storage locker you know, something like 14 years ago. And about Seven years into it, they made, John Loop made a movie called Finding Vivian Meyer, or the documentary that really you know, made the world see Vivian Meyer and, and her interest in her took off. So I was just a regular person, and I had heard that the documentary was up for an Academy Award, and so I watched it, and I was so taken with her photographs that I became very interested in her, but even more so the fact that they had done all this research for years and never could find out anything about her family, her life in New York, her motivations for photography. And so I started to, just for my own edification, study her a bit on my own. And the deeper I got, you know, the bigger the mystery came and I got kind of sucked into it. And finally, I started to want to really officially research it. And so I got in touch with all the people that worked on Vivian Meyer so that I could help them with their research. What was the first step there? What was the first thing that you started to try to peel away at? Unofficially, what I was very interested in was the people in the documentary had very different descriptions of Vivian. You know, some said she was cold, some said she was warm. You said some said she was dour, some said she was funny. And I couldn't figure out how one person could be all those things. And I felt they were very sincere in their descriptions of her. So that was kind of in the background of what I wanted to figure out all along. But the very first concrete step was that I, when I contacted those that were involved in Vivian, they said the most important thing they needed to find out was what happened to Vivian's brother. They knew a brother existed from a census, but they knew nothing about him. And all public records stopped that related to him in 1942, which is when he was 22 years old. And it was really important because at that time, the estate was being evaluated by Cook County, and it was the hottest issue of the time. And they needed to trace what happened to the brother. If he had heirs, you know, they would be the first in line for Vivian's estate. And so I said, okay, I bet I can find him. And I went about my research for a couple months. And in fact, I was able to trace his whole life. And then once I did that, I was kind of invited into the inner circle you know, your your book, Vivian Meyer Developed, it's an extensive telling of Vivian's life story, but it's not just a telling of, of Vivian's story. All the questions we have about Vivian's psychology are kind of set up by, well, where did she come from? And that, that's questions regarding her family. And so the first part of your book, you really kind of set up uh, the family tree and exactly where Vivian came from. And, you know, I think there are probably a few surprises there. I mean, can you tell us where 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 you started there and how in the world you found what you found? You know, this was 
focus really of my book, and it might not necessarily be for all biographies, but Vivian's behavior was so puzzling and there was so much secretiveness that I knew the story of the family history would be the key to unlocking her. And so the first thing I did actually was I used some public records. If you want to look at some someone, it's very easy to get like death, death records, like birth and um, date of death and where they're buried. So I did that for Vivian's 10 relatives that had lived in the New York area. And it was very interesting. It was very telling right from the start because the 10 relatives you know, that I had gotten from census reports were buried in nine different places. And that's very unusual because most families have a cemetery and they're either together with, you know, the kin or, you know, maybe another cemetery if they go with the maternal side. But to be that spread out, I knew there was some major troubled family history involved. Um, so that kind of set the framework for me. Then what I did was try to tra trace the lives of each of those 10 people and find out where they lived in New York. And, and you know, Vivian actually spent 30 years of her life in New York, but we hadn't at that point found anybody in New York that had remembered her or been interviewed. And so what I did, and this was the hardest part of the project by far, was I took Vivian's photographs. And by this point, Jeff and John, who owned the archives, both gave me their, their full archives. So I had 140,000 photographs to look at. And for the first time, they could be put in chronological order, at least in my mind, uh, because they were two different archives. And I would examine each photograph for clues of who the people were that were in them. So for instance, very early on when Vivian arrived in New York and before she even bought her Roloflex camera, so she was using her box camera that she had first used for a year in France, um, there were pictures of a family, an Italian family in a tenement brownstone. And for two different occasions, Vivian took photographs of them like in a session on a rooftop. And there were three daughters and a mother and a father. And I could tell from it that she knew them well, but by the way, you know, there were a lot of pictures. It was her first photo session. So I could tell she was some kind of friend or acquaintance of them, but also it's basically her first photo session. And that if I found these people, it would be very revealing. And usually Vivian left no notes at all. In this one case, there was a last name on the back of a photo. It was said either Randazzo or Randazza. So I had a really good head start, and I figured, oh, you know, in a couple of weeks, I'll find them. Well, it took me over a year because, first of all, I had never heard this last name before, but there were something like, you know, 500 Randazzos in the, um, the New York area, and very few in Manhattan in this um, interesting, you know, I'm sorry, interestingly, but the ones that were didn't fit the bill, like the, the, you know, the, the people in the family. And so I ended up, for some reason, I thought they would be in Queens or something because in the background was a white apartment building. And I wasted all this time calling people in different boroughs and whatnot. And I, even though there were backgrounds in the photographs, I just couldn't identify them. And then one day I was driving, I live in Manhattan down Third Avenue, and I saw a building and it looked exactly like the one in Vivian's photograph, but it was backwards, like the configuration, like the balconies were on the right instead of the one, that kind of thing. So I ran back home and I flipped Vivian's photograph and then it was all there, like the river was in the right place, the building, it was right near not only where I lived, but where Vivian lived, which I knew. And you could almost see Vivian's apartment in the background, and I had spent like a year. So once I got that, then I was able to triangulate all the buildings and figure out the exact rooftop that the photos were taken. It no longer existed, but I could figure out from old maps what the building was. And I, I did go on old maps. Um, there's a great historical site in New York where you can do that. And then 
I looked at different kinds of census reports, and it turns out that the Randazzo in the 1930s census didn't surface because it was spelled completely wrong. But the family lived there, and it had you know three daughters and a mother and a father. And so then I knew the names of the the people in the family, and I well to do my normal thing, which is to find you look. I actually look at obituaries, and I found out that there was one still living sister, and I called and I went into Queens where she did live, and met with her. And she, even you know, she was in her 80s. She remembered everything about Vivian to a T. And so I was able to learn so much about her, not only Vivian as a person, but about her early years of photography. So that's the kind of thing that I did. And in my book, I have some of the backstories, like the one I just described to you, of some of the crazy things that I had to do to actually find people in New York. But in the end, I found almost everyone that um, knew her well in New York, and that made a huge difference in understanding her story. I think it, it struck me as I was reading the, the first uh, third of the book just how hard it was to track down Vivian's family because, you know, when you're searching through these public records, it seemed like members of the family had intentionally been throwing out red herrings on government paperwork for years to cover up one thing or another. How do you track down someone when people are intentionally putting wrong information down? Well, this was the hardest thing of all, because you go into this thinking, okay, they make a few mistakes on public records, which way every single public record you find has a mistake, I guarantee you, but of one sort or another. But you don't think someone's just going to make things up, right? So, for instance, the 1940 census had Vivian's brother, her mother and her father, and Vivian all living together on East 64th Street as a happy nuclear family. And it had the brother as younger rather than older than Vivian, which the 1930 census had him older. And that is why the brother was so hard to find, because there was an eight-year difference in what his age could be. So here's this census in 1940, and it has this family, you know, living there. Meanwhile, the brother was long gone, wasn't even associated with the mother. The father was already remarried and living in Queens. And Vivian's mother just fabricated an entry of a happy nuclear family, you know, living in this apartment together. And in fact, they had never lived together, four of them. So they were always covering up reality to put forth some sort of fantasy version of themselves. And what I had to do, another example of that actually, is the grandmother was had Vivian's mother out of wedlock. And so she was from the very beginning covering up public records to make it seem like she was married. So she was making up husbands and changing ages and that kind of thing. But usually some true data on each record because they needed it for official purposes. And so I had to look at the totality of the records. Like I started to think something was wrong when the 1940 had the husband there. And then I found an, entry in Queens that I knew had to be the husband because of the specificity of his job and things like that. And then I started to get suspicious. And then when I looked at all the records with that in mind, that some things are covered up, I could get, I could extract the real story, but it took me a long time to really realize what they were doing because you just would never go into it thinking that a family would do that. Well, one of the interesting relationships that you document in the book is her relationship with Emily Hulkamard. Can you talk about the special relationship that the two of them had? So Vivian's mother was pretty distant and removed. She was an unstable, irresponsible person. So a lot of times Vivian was left to interact with or be watched over by her grandmother's European friends. And her grandmother was a fantastic cook and worked for all the famous people in New York. And so 